Welcome to Section 5, Statistics. In this section, we're going to take a look at TCP IP, just a general overview, what it is and how it operates, time values and summaries, how to take a look at the difference in time between packets to diagnose and troubleshoot things. We'll also look at all of the great statistics that are available from Wireshark. And we'll take a look at the expert system in Wireshark, which is a great feature that allows you to take a look at the errors and critical issues in a packet capture and it'll bring them right up front for you, easy to view. This is video 4.1 TCP IP overview. In this video we're going to take a look at the basics of TCP IP, how packets are built, and the resolution processes that are in place such as DNS and ARP. In networking we have two models that we commonly use, OSI and TCP IP. On the left side we have the OSI model, and on the right side we have TCP IP. And I've tried to match them up so that you can see how the different layers of each model line up with each other. Now a uh, detailed training on the OSI model and the TCP IP model and the basics of networking is outside the scope of this course, but I just wanted to reference it real quick since we use it in Wireshark on a day-to-day -day basis. When we use Wireshark we're commonly concerned with layers 2 through 7 of the OSI model. And most commonly when you use Wireshark it's probably because something weird is going on and that usually when something weird is going on that's often application related or the system running an application. So most commonly you'll find yourself using Wireshark to diagnose problems that are in the upper layers, especially layer 7, but you can certainly use it to troubleshoot connectivity issues between devices on layer 3 or layer 2. And while there's a number of TCP IP services and protocols that we use, to help us communicate over a network. Know that we reference the layer that that protocol resides on based on the OSI model, not the actual TCP IP model's layer. What I'd like to do is run through the building of a packet, which will give you an idea as to how the values are entered into a packet for the different fields. And since we're looking at those fields in Wireshark, it's certainly a good thing to know. So what I've done is in a browser I've opened up a connection to pbs.org. And what we're going to do is follow through that connection and show how it found the resource and then sent its first data packets to it. So the first thing that your system does is it needs to figure out what port number to use. So when you open up your web browser and you go to pbs.org, depending on how you enter the address up into the address bar of the browser, the application of the browser is going to know whether or not you want to use port 80 by default for HTTP, or port 443 for SSL, or maybe some other custom port. So right away, your computer knows what port number that it needs to start communicating on. Since I went to pbs.org without any sort of SSL connection, it by default knew that it was going to have to use port 80. The next thing it has to do is figure out where that service is. So I went to pbs.org, but my system didn't know where pbs.org resides. Remember I mentioned that the DNS, so remember that I mentioned that DNS deals with the resolution of a name to an address. And so my system took a look at the DNS cache on my local system, which is a rolling cache of addresses that it has already resolved, and it looked for pbs.org. And it saw that pbs.org didn't exist in the cache. So it said, okay, I need to go send that out to my DNS server to get a hopeful response of where this resource is located. My DNS server happens to be on my gateway, which is 77.1. This is common for standard home networks. It may not be there. It could have been a remote resource as well, such as a Google DNS server or OpenDNS or some other. If this is a remote DNS server that I'm trying to connect to, then my system is going to take a look in my route table and figure out where does it need to go in order to access that DNS server. So if it's remote outside of my network, it's going to take a look at my route table and realize that it has to go out through my gateway in order to go talk to the DNS server. And when it does so, it's going to check my ARP cache to see if there's a layer 2 address for my gateway so that it can send a frame to the gateway. If my system didn't have ARP cache entry for my gateway, then my system would have sent an ARP packet out looking for the physical address for 192.168.77.1.
my system happened to have it in its ARP cache since I commonly access that IP address. And so we don't see an ARP packet here. What we do see here is the first packet is a DNS packet. So my system saw that it was 77.1 was my DNS server, and it knew that it was a local resource. It checked my route table. It realized that that's on my physical interface there. Uh, we're already connected to the 77 network, and I already had an ARP cache entry for 77.1, so it didn't need any of that information, and it automatically built the DNS packet. And then we can see in here in IPv4, my destination is 77.1. It built all that without having to produce any other packets to find this information. So my system then sent out its DNS request asking for pbs.org. And if we go down and take a look at the UDP section here, you can see that we're using port 53, which is for DNS. And if we expand DNS, we can look at the queries, and we can see that we're asking for pbs.org. We then have to wait for the DNS response. And we see the next packet here for DNS. We receive a standard query response for pbs.org. And if we look at DNS in the packet details pane, we can take a look at the answers in this packet. And you'll see that pbs.org has a CNAME entry for this address. And then there's an A record entry at this IP. The A record entry is what we care about. So now my system has an IP address for pbs.org so that I can build a TCP handshake to pbs.org to the web server so that it can then begin flowing HTTP data back and forth. So if we look at the next packet in line, we have our SYN. So this is the first packet in our three-way handshake for TCP. If you're familiar with TCP at all, it goes SYN, SYNAC, ACK, and that's your three-way handshake to open up a connection. So my first packet here has a destination address of 54.243.141.169. If we look at that response that came back in DNS, that's the address that was provided for the A record. So now my system knows what IP address to craft its TCP packet for. So we have a source of my local system, destination to the server for pbs.org that it received, and then it sends out its handshake request. It then gets a SYNAC in response, saying, yes, I see your connection request. Let's create a connection. And then my system responds saying, yeah, that sounds great, I acknowledge. And then finally we begin our first HTTP packet. My system sends an HTTP packet out to that same server and says get HTTP. So it's saying please send me your beginning index.html and any other data for the HTTP resource. And again, it knew that it needed to use port 80 HTTP unencrypted because when we entered that into the browser, the browser application let the stack know that it was using port 80. And so that's the basics on how a TCP packet is built and your system requests a resource from some sort of server or other device out there. Up next, we have time values and summaries. There's some great summary information panes that we can take a look at and we can use time to help us diagnose problems in a packet capture.